हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाई जूस एग्जाम वेरी वेरी वॉर्म गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू आर डूइंग गुड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू टूडे सेशन ऑफ द हिंदू न्यूज पर्नलिस इट इज टेन एम एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल स्पेशली दोज हु हैव जॉइंड इन पंक्चुअली राइट ऑन टाइम एज नो every single day sharp at 10 am we have this live session where we discuss the most important news stories from the hindu newspaper both for the mains examination and the prelims examination as well so those newspaper articles that require deeper analysis we take up those also and those newspaper articles which have certain factual information for your prelims examination those also are taken up before we begin analyzing the hindu newspaper for today just a customary request to all of you once again if you have still not subscribed to our youtube channel for some reason please do hit the subscribe button and do share this with your friends and leave all the comments that you have been leaving so far we read all those comments before we begin analyzing the paper a very quick reminder as you know on our youtube channel we have been running the target prelims 2023 series where one by one we are discussing the most apt strategy to go forward in the last 90 days before the prelims examination today's session at 8 pm live will be on geography where we will be discussing how exactly to prepare in the last 90 days before the prelims examination what to read what not to read what you can actually afford to miss and what are the topics that you just cannot afford to miss i know for all of you geography is one of the most important subjects so please don't forget to join in this is the schedule of the, the strategy series that we have we already had videos on polity current affairs economy these were the videos if you could not watch them for some reason they are still on our youtube channel you can watch them tonight it will be for geography tomorrow we'll have a video on environment and ecology and science and technology and on 6th of march there will be the history class that will be from 9 to 10 while all the other classes are from 8 to 9 so don't forget to join us for that as well now let's see what are the topics that we have in store for you what is it that we will be discussing so from the editorial section from those articles which need a deeper analysis we have three important articles we will be talking about clean tech in india how we are moving towards clean technology technology that uses renewable energy especially in the rural parts of india how can we give it more push that is what we'll be discussing number 1 second we'll be discussing about the supreme court's order with respect to the appointment of the chief election commissioner and the other election commissioners as you know supreme court just gave an order about the appointment procedure of the election commissioners how important that is that is what we'll be discussing then we'll talk about the world bank deciding to loan about 1 billion dollars to india especially for our public health sector so we'll be analyzing what that loan is all about then we will be taking up those articles which are important from the prelims point of view for example we'll be talking about how the government has announced that some people working for the central government can still opt for the old pension scheme we will then be discussing about supreme court's decision about consumer courts the supreme court has changed the eligibility criteria for the person who becomes the head of these consumer boards then we'll be discussing about the kuno park where we have introduced 20 cheetahs now how is their health what is their plan going forward then the world bank index on working women has come out what is india's ranking what is india's score what are the problems and then in the end we'll be discussing about a particular scheme called the samarth scheme which is introduced by the textile ministry what is that scheme what will happen this is what we will be discussing so this is the agenda for the day let's begin with the very first topic then the very first topic is about clean tech especially in the rural areas now before going deeper into this article let me try and explain to you what this actually means the article is saying that in the rural areas especially we are seeing increasing number of people now opting for clean technology appliances let me give you certain examples of what is this clean tech the clean tech appliances for example would be those appliances which use let's assume renewable energy let me give you an example have you all heard of solar cookers so there are solar cookers cookers which are solar powered 
Similarly, there are food processors which are used in our houses. Some people call it Mixi, some people call it food processor. Those are now also run using solar energy. Similarly, you have geysers. There are a lot of solar geysers now. You don't have to put any electricity into them. All these are examples of clean tech appliances. So recently a report came out from Council on Energy, Environment and Water which says about 13,000 people have adopted these clean tech livelihood appliances in the rural areas and about 80% of them are women. Now this is expected because you also understand when a household has to take a decision which kind of cooker to use, which kind of appliance to use. In most of the cases, it would be women only who would take the final call. Because the women only will be the one who would have much more knowledge about all these things. And that is why it is not surprising that it is majority of women, 80% of women who have taken up this plunge to move towards clean tech. Now, using this clean technology appliances has a lot of benefits. One, obviously it has environmental benefits. Second, it also has health benefits as well. Thirdly, in a lot of rural households, especially where the women are the ones who are responsible for let's say collecting the wood, then using the wood as a fuel, the women have to work very, very hard and they spend the entire day just to fetch water, just to fetch wood, for example, and they don't have any time for themselves. They don't have any time to give to their children as well. So for women especially, introducing this kind of technology, that is clean tech, can be very, very good for their quality of life. Not just their health, but also their economic status can improve in the long run because they would not have to spend money on other types of fuels. And this is why only 13,000 people have adopted these appliances. But now we have to make sure as per the article that many, many more people now go ahead and accept these kind of appliances. As per the author, by 2030, India would see about 3 crore or 30 million Women owned MSMEs that will employ 15 crore people. India right now is a huge market and that is a great opportunity for anyone in India who wants to do business. See, if you want to do business in India, let's assume, the good part is you already have such a huge market that is ready to buy products. Unlike some of the other countries where the population is low, when you make something, when you do certain kind of business, you have to find your clients or consumers overseas. That is not the case with India. In India, we still have a huge market and that is why the market opportunity for the clean tech appliances is also very, very high. In urban areas, we always have much better technology. In urban areas, many people have already opted for these kind of appliances. But even today, majority of India, two thirds of India lives in a rural part of the country. Unless rural India starts using these kind of appliances, we might not see the kind of change that we are hoping for. Now, the article says, since 13,000 is a very small number, how can we reach out to more women in the rural areas? How is it possible that more and more women go ahead and start using such appliances? They have given some reasons or some way forward ideas of how we can get this technology to reach more and more women. First idea that they give, leverage the experience of early women adopters. Meaning that those women from the 13,000 who have started using these kind of technologies, who have started using clean tech technologies, they should be asked to then become kind of brand ambassadors. They should be asked to share their experiences with each and everyone so that other women can also learn and they can also buy these appliances. Second suggestion, hyper local events and demos should be organized. See, let's assume that I have to bring in a new appliance in my kitchen. Let's say I have to experiment with solar cooker or something else. I would want a demo. I can't just see an ad on TV and think, okay, I'll order it. It is always better if I see someone doing this or using this in front of me. When I see a demo, I will have a much better chance of buying. And that is why hyper local event means events in a small scale, in a city, in a village should be done. 
and people should be told how to use this product so that it increases people's familiarity with these kind of products that is the clean technology products then we should also enable easy finance to purchase these products see the point is when you go towards clean tech when you try and buy these kind of products that are using solar energy these are not very cheap these are considered as slightly more expensive as compared to the usual products so when you are asking someone to buy expensive products that means you also have to make it affordable give them finance options for example emis or even better if you can have no cost emis or maybe an ng or government can come into finance then support the forward market linkage as well meaning that those companies which are making these kind of products if there's a company making a solar cooker if there's a company making a solar geyser those kind of things those companies should also be given a push those companies should be encouraged the government should help them in selling their product as well and in the end the policy of the government should be so that we can actually scale this to a much much larger level see as i told you india has a great advantage that no other country has the scale of india's population and the population which is increasingly earning more money the middle class of india as we call it their earning potential is increasing when people earn more money they are ready to spend more money as well meaning that india has a huge market where a lot of companies can come and sell their products and this is the advantage that we have and this should not be missed a lot of clean tech products can come into india now this is what the article was all about however if you talk about clean technology and the government's push towards clean technology in india the one example that everyone will give you or the most successful example of the indian government pushing people towards clean technology is actually electric vehicles in india probably no other initiative of the government so far has made such a big impact in terms of environment and clean tech as evs have that is electric vehicle push you see so many two wheelers now which are electric two wheelers a lot of them are now running on the road in fact it has become very very common so many companies have come up with electric two wheelers battery operated we have ev cars also made by big car companies many people are opting for that as well there are even auto rickshaws that are coming up which are driven by these kind of batteries so government of india at least in one area of clean tech has worked very well that is ev and this is why the government of india can and should follow the same kind of strategy for other kind of things as well and this is why the government of india should learn from the ev example this is just a timeline of how the government of india gave a push to ev mainly niti ayog as you know since 2011 when we first started national council for electric mobility since then to today electric cars electric two wheelers have become so 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 common you see the two wheelers running all around by different kind of companies you see so many electric cars running around even the charging stations their frequency has increased considerably earlier when someone used to buy or someone used to buy ev car or think of buying an ev car the problem that they had was would we have enough charging stations or not but that infrastructure has also improved so the government has made sure that at the end of the day clean technology in the form of ev is given a push we also have a lot of other government initiatives to give a push to ev we have fame 1 and fame 2 fame stands for faster adoption and manufacturing of hybrid and electric vehicle many state governments also offer certain subsidies tax incentives if you want to buy ev government has also now started using ev buses so public transportation a lot in delhi for example in karnataka also you will see certain buses used in public transportation that are run by electric batteries so all this tells us that the government of india has been able to give a push to clean tech at least in the space of ev and the same can be done in other ways as well for giving a push to clean tech appliances which are used in the rural areas this was the first important article before i go on to the second one and start discussing about what exactly <clears throat> did
did the Supreme Court say in the judgment? I would quickly take up a few questions here. Okay. Uh, one question that I have is what is forward and backward linkage? So basically, let me give you an example of forward and backward linkage. Let's assume I run a company and my company manufactures solar cooker. Forward linkage means that my company should be given the support to connect with the people who will buy the product. So if I'm making solar cooker, I will only be successful if there are enough people to buy my product. If my product is very expensive, people can't buy it, the government should come and give certain subsidies. That is called a forward linkage. Company should be held to be connected to their buyers. Then on the other hand, backward linkage means the company should also be held by the government in procuring their raw material. For example, if I make a solar cooker, come solar cooker and my company has to import a lot of things from China. So if I have some problem in that, the government should come and help me with that. So backward linkage means helping the company in acquiring stuff. Forward linkage would mean the government should help me in connecting to the market as well. Uh, then someone is asking what is hybrid vehicle? Hybrid vehicles basically are those vehicles that can run on battery also and that can run on petrol or diesel also. So there are a lot of cars these days that have both the options. So there are cars for example uh, the new version of Honda City if you look at it. There are a lot of cars which have electric battery also so you can run with battery as well and you can run with fuel as well. That is the hybrid vehicle that we have. Okay. Perfect. Let's move ahead then. The second important article that we have here is about the recent judgment of the Supreme Court of India. I am hopeful that all of you have already read about what is a Supreme Court judgment exactly. Let me repeat in very simple terms what did the Supreme Court say just a couple of days back. In Indian polity, you would have read about the Election Commission of India. The Election Commission of India, as you know, is a constitutional body responsible for conducting elections for president, vice president, parliament and the state legislatures. Now, as per the Constitution of India, the Election Commission of India shall comprise of a chief election commissioner and as many election commissioners as the president decides from time to time. So right now, we have a chief election commissioner and two other election commissioners. The problem here is the appointment process. See, India's entire democracy, our entire democratic structure is dependent on how fair and how well can the election commission of India work. If it is a body that is controlled by the government alone, if it is a body where appointments are not done in a transparent manner, that means our entire democracy can be in danger. So many commissions in the past, many committees in the past, including the second ARC, have suggested time and time again that ideally we should have the appointment of the election commissioners through a committee. Because right now what happens, right now at present, the president of India appoints the chief election commissioner and the election commissioners. The advice to the president of India is given just by the government. So prime minister, for example, can give any name to the president of India and the president of India will appoint that person as the chief election commissioner or the election commissioners. Usually, how does the government choose? Government of India usually chooses from senior bureaucrats. So senior IAS officers or senior officers of other services which are considered close to the government the government usually gives their name to the president of India and that person then becomes the election commissioner. This is where the problem starts. The problem is since the election commissioner of India has such an important role, that means that ideally they should be appointed through a committee that should recommend the name to the president. The government alone should not just have the power to do that. Because right now opposition has no role to play. Right now, the opposition parties cannot say that this person should become the election commissioner, or that person should become the election commissioner. That is what the issue is. Many committees have suggested in the past that should change. Since the parliament never made a law on this, finally what happened was the Supreme Court said, since parliament is not making a law, let us make a law. The Supreme Court decided that from now onwards, 
chief election commissioner and the other election commissioners shall be appointed by the president but on the advice of a three member committee these three members shall be the prime minister leader of the operation of the lok sabha or leader of the single largest opposition party whichever the case is and the third member shall be the chief justice of india so three member committee prime minister leader of opposition of the lok sabha and the chief justice of india these three people together should suggest to the president the name of the next election commissioner and that is how the election commissioner should be appointed that is the verdict given by the supreme court now i have two questions for you and i want all of you to tell me the answer in the comment section once the video is over in the comment section tell me number 1 which other body is appointed in exactly the same manner meaning that which other body is appointed by the president on the advice of this three member committee only prime minister leader of the opposition and the chief justice of india they suggest to president appointment of which other body first i have one more question for you okay i already see people commenting in the chat i will request you to leave that in the comment section as well now apart from that there is one more thing that you have to understand about the election commission of india since the election commission of india has so much powers since the election commission of india has always had this responsibility of conducting the elections and deciding everything about the elections the election commission of india decide the schedule of the election they decide what will be the location of the uh, the voting booth they will decide when the results will come in they will decide each and everything one other question that i have for you is how can the supreme court of india give such a verdict what powers do they have because if you read about the jurisdiction of the supreme court you will see jurisdiction of the supreme court is that they can hear cases between center and the state states and the states etc but my question is under what powers or where is it written that supreme court can give such kind of judgments as well do think about it and tell me in the comment section of the video later on now let's go ahead now as i told you this constitutional bench of the supreme court that was a five judges bench they gave this order just a couple of days back there was actually a petition filed in the supreme court on this matter the petitioner said that it is not just about the appointment of the election commissioners the petitioner said something else as well let me tell you what the constitution of india says there shall be chief election commissioner and as many election commissioners as the president decides from time to time meaning that in the constitution of india we only have the mention of the chief election commissioner the constitution only mentions chief election commissioner and not about the other election commissioners so what is the difference the difference is because the constitution only mentions the chief election commissioner the powers responsibilities removal all of this in the constitution is only provided for the chief election commissioner in simple terms the constitution of india says chief election commissioner can be removed in exactly the same manner as a supreme court judge so just like the process of the supreme court judge goes up the same manner will be followed for the removal of the chief election commissioner but for the other two election commissioners the process is not the same for other two election commissioners president can remove them on the advice of the chief election commissioner that is a big difference let me repeat the chief election commissioner can be removed in exactly the same manner as a supreme court judge while the other election commissioners can be removed by the president of india on the advice of the chief election commissioner that is the problem the petitioner said that the removal process should be the same since the powers are the same their working is the same we should have the same kind of removal process as well but supreme court said no we can't do that supreme court said that chief election commissioner is more important because without the chief election commissioner we cannot have article 324 working properly so they are not the same they said that parliament can make a law whatever they want but we will not change the removal process they only change the appointment process for now 
Now, this demand of changing the process of appointment of the election commissioner was a very, very long standing demand. The reason being, if you look at the Constitution of India, the Constitution of India says that the chief election commissioner shall be appointed by the president as per the provisions established by the parliament. Meaning that the parliament was supposed to make laws on how exactly will the election commissioners be appointed. But parliament has not done so this far. And this is what the problem is. The Supreme Court says parliament has been very, very lackluster. They have been avoiding this issue for such a long time. So now we have to take the powers in our own hands and we will be the one who will decide how exactly will this appointment happen. Now, as I told you, this verdict of the Supreme Court was about the appointment process, but the case that was filed was not just about the appointment process. The case that was filed was also about the removal process. That removal process of chief election commissioners and election commissioners should be the same, which is not the case right now. But the Supreme Court said that no, we can't do that. The chief election commissioner is mentioned in Article 324. They are very, very, very important. The Supreme Court also said that the funding of election commission, having a permanent secretariat, etc. That is for the government of India to decide. The government of India should decide about their funding, etc. Now, this is where there is one other very big issue that many people ignore. Let me come to that issue. We usually talk about appointment of election commission. We talk about removal of election commissioners. But one thing that we don't talk about usually is the funding part. Now, why do they need funds? Please understand something. When the election commissioner of India conducts elections all across the country on a state legislature, they spend a lot of money. They have to buy the EVM machines. They have to arrange for all this infrastructure. They have to ensure that everything is in place have electoral rolls, etc. Everything is required. Meaning that the election commission also requires a lot of money. They don't have any independent budget. The election commission of India requests the government of India for the budget. Now the problem is a lot of times when the election commission of India asks the government for some budget, the government usually delays it. I'll give you a real example. There is something called the VV Pat. I'm sure all of you would know about this. VV Pat is Voter Verifiable Paper Audit Trail. So in simple term, this is a very small printer kind of a machine attached with the EVM. When you vote in the EVM, let's say you press the button for a for BJP. What will happen is there will be a small printout that will come out from the VV Pat. You can cross check whether the same party symbol is there. It is just to cross check that the button that you press, your vote went to the same political party. Now, over here, this is something that the Election Commission of India did not make mandatory for some years. Till 2017, we did not have VVPAT on all the EVM machines. VVPATs were only a part of the few EVM machines. That is why opposition parties kept on challenging this. Opposition parties kept on saying that EVM machines are corrupt. You vote for someone, your vote goes for someone else. Because VV pads were not attached. This case even went to Supreme Court of India. In Supreme Court of India, when the Supreme Court asked, why is it that Election Commission of India is not using VV pad machine with every EVM? The Election Commission said, we have the Election Commission of India who or which requires money. But at the end of the day, since the Election Commission of India is dependent on the government for the money, whatever money they actually want from the government side, the money is not really given to them. That also remains a big, big, big issue. That is also something that the Supreme Court wants the issue to be resolved. Uh, I am seeing a lot of messages of buffering. Uh, is it working now? Now is it fine? Okay. A lot of people are saying it is fine now. Uh, for those who are still facing buffering, I would request you to quickly refresh it. Is it okay now? Is it okay now? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for confirming. Thank you so much for confirming. So you did not miss out on anything. Let me repeat what I just said in the last 30 seconds or so. 
what I said in the last 30 seconds was since the election commission of India is dependent on the government for its funding since the election commission of India does not have its own independent budget that is why the Supreme Court was asked to ensure that the election commission is not dependent on the government for the money but Supreme Court said that no we will not intervene in this manner this is what I said in the last 30 seconds so you did not miss anything don't worry this is the only thing that I said in the last 30 seconds now if you look at the constitution of India it talks about the election commission of India being a constitutional body as I told you the election commission of India shall comprise of a chief election commissioner and as many election commissioners as the president wants from time to time as you know till 1989 the election commission of India was only a one member body but now since 1993 it is a three member body we have a chief election commissioner and we have two other election commissioners as well although one is called the chief election commissioner other two are called election commissioners but even then the powers of all three are the same whatever decision that they have to take they take it by a majority only let me give you a simple example let's assume the elections took place and there was a news that in some place there was some problem in the election there was some corruption violence etc so now is or why would the election commission go ahead and cancel the elections if they have to decide that should we cancel the elections or not the three members that is the chief election commissioner and the other two actually discuss and vote on this whichever side two people are that side will win so if chief election commissioner says for example that we should cancel the elections and the other two election commissioners say we should not cancel then this side will win because they have the majority so that is why this is a difference between the two while one is chief election commissioner other are only election commissioners even then the power still is the same between the two right then the next article of importance for the means examination specifically is about the world bank the world bank has recently decided to lend 1 billion dollars to India for health sector now this is not a news that is something that happens very very uh, very very un unfrequently India usually gets a lot of loan from the World Bank for various development purposes we get loans for different schemes for poverty elevation schemes for certain developmental schemes in health sector also there have been a lot of government schemes that have been funded by the World Bank the World Bank has decided to give 1 billion dollar loan to India for two schemes so 500 million dollars for one scheme and other 500 for the other scheme what are these two 500 million dollars will be given for India's Pradhan Mantri Ayushman Bharat Health Infrastructure Mission. So under this mission, 500 million dollars will go to public health system for pandemic preparedness program. Now that the entire world has faced a pandemic, now we know how problematic, how difficult the situation can be many governments around the world are now spending more and more money to be more prepared about future pandemics so government of india has taken 500 million dollars for our pandemic preparedness program under which we will try and improve our systems of surveillance we will try to ensure that we collect as much data as possible about india's healthcare sector so that we are better prepared for a pandemic the second scheme under which another 500 million dollars have been given is to enhance health service delivery program meaning that to have better infrastructure at the local level because when a person falls ill only very few people can afford going to a private hospital a lot of people depend on the government for primary health care so this 500 million dollars will be used for developing or making sure that our health infrastructure at the primary health care level becomes much better so Again, $1 billion in total given by the World Bank for Pradhan Mantri Ayushman Bharat Health Infrastructure Mission. Out of that $1 billion, $500 million will go for our pandemic preparedness to be more prepared for the future pandemics and the other $500 will be to ensure that our health infrastructure at the primary healthcare level especially becomes much, much, much better. Now, as you know, the World Bank loans are very long loans unlike the IMF. IMF loans are shorter duration, 
high rate of interest than the World Bank. World Bank loans, this loan for example, will be of 18 and a half years, very low rate of interest. There is usually a grace period also attached to it that you can increase it for five more years as well. World Bank while giving the loan also made statements that India's infrastructure in terms of health and India's performance and parameters have also improved. As per the World Bank, India's life expectancy has increased from 58 to 69.8 in 30 years. Even our income level, if you see the other countries at a similar income level as compared to India. Let's say there are 50 countries having same per capita income that India has. Amongst those countries, India has a much better life expectancy. Under 5 mortality rate, infant mortality, maternal mortality, all of these are improving. India is now at par with other countries at a similar income level. So the World Bank has identified the progress made by government of India and thus they are happy to give these kind of loans. One question that I see in the chat, is it free of interest? No, World Bank is not giving a free of interest loan. To very poor nations, they give loans at a very low rate of interest but not zero. Now, one other thing that I wanted to share with you is that when you look at this year's budget, the budget on different sectors has been discussed in detail. But if you look at the budget of health sector in detail, you will see one very interesting thing, which was not highlighted in most of the newspaper articles. If you look at this scheme where the government is giving or government is taking loan from the World Bank, look at this scheme. That is the Prime Minister Ayushwan Bharat Health Infrastructure Mission PM Abhim Scheme. In this scheme, look at this budget allocation. The government of India has allocated more than double the budget of the last year. Last year's revised estimates for this scheme was 2167 crores. This year's budget allocation is 4800 crores. So, not just through the World Bank, internally also government of India is spending a lot more money on this infrastructure scheme in the healthcare sector. We have seen an increase of about 124%. So that is also something that the government of India is focusing on, not just by the World Bank, but internally as well. Now, just to give you a few details about this scheme, the Ayushman Bharat scheme, as you know, was an insurance scheme. But under that also, we have many other components. So one component of this is PM Ayushman Bharat Health Infrastructure Mission. This scheme was launched in October 2021. The biggest significance of this scheme was it wanted to improve infrastructure in the healthcare sector. As I said earlier, usually what happens whenever someone falls ill, People in India especially avoid going to the doctors. Why? You would have this habit you can see in your family also. If your father falls ill, your mother falls ill or anyone in your family falls ill and you tell them, let's go to a doctor, they'll say, no, 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 let's not go to a doctor. Why? For some reason they think, no, it will be expensive, it will be cumbersome, I don't want to go to a doctor. The other problem is because in India, very few people have health insurance. Very few people. Those who are working in the corporate sector, they get health insurance from their organizations. But personally, many people do not have health insurance. So now they know when they go to a doctor, they'll have to spend a lot of money. The other option that they have is that they can go to a private doctor or a government doctor. Going to a private doctor again will take a lot of money. So they search for government healthcare facilities. That is why government healthcare facilities are so, so, so important. Because when a poor person falls ill, they would look towards going to a government hospital so that they don't have to spend money. And government hospitals, as you also know, are not very good on infrastructure. The top government hospitals like Ames, etc. Are, are world class. But at a local level, primary healthcare level, the government health infrastructure is not that great. And that is why we have been spending a lot more money to improve that health infrastructure. Under this scheme, First objective of the government is to improve health infrastructure, to have better clinics, more primary healthcare clinics. Second, use technology as much as possible 
to identify if there are certain diseases that are spreading all across or a larger population. The better or the sooner that we get information, let's say we get information that malaria is spreading or dengue is spreading in a certain part of the city or we get information that polio is spreading in certain part of the city then you can take action accordingly that can only happen when you are tracking this using technology so that is also something that is an objective of this program and thirdly to expand research on covid 19 and other infectious diseases so that if we have this kind of a situation once again we are able to handle this much better so this Ayushman Bharat infrastructure development scheme that we are seeing here that is focused on number one improving primary healthcare infrastructure number two on using more technology and number three having more research on infectious diseases as well. This is an example I wanted to give you of how the government of India tries to encourage more and more people to participate in governance. How many of you use the My GOV app? If you use the My GOV app, you will see that the government of India keeps on organizing many competitions, quizzes, you can write articles there as well. On the My GOV app recently, for example, there was this competition to design a logo for this scheme. Pradhan Mantri Aishwan Bharat Health Infrastructure Mission. There was a design a logo competition on the My GOV app. I advise every one of you to at least download the My GOV app because it will help you in understanding a lot more government schemes and you can also get a lot of insights about the government programs. These were the important articles from the mains point of view. As you know now, we have also made it a habit to discuss some prelims factual information as well with all of you to take up those articles specifically which are important for the prelims examination as well. So let's see what are the important articles with factual information for prelims exam in today's Hindu newspaper. The front page of the Hindu newspaper had an article where the central government is now saying some officers from the central government can opt for the old pension scheme as well. Only some. Now who are these people? What is the old pension scheme? Let's take an idea. There are two pension schemes that you would usually see in the news. Old pension scheme and the new pension system or scheme, whatever you want to call it, NPS. In the old pension scheme, you from your salary did not have to contribute anything. As a government servant, once you retired, whatever your last salary was, half of that salary will be given to you as the pension. You don't have to give any extra money. That was the old pension scheme. No contribution from the employer. The government of India realized that this is adding a lot of financial burden on the government. So government of India replaced this with a new scheme. This new scheme, the new pension system that we have, this was applicable to all those who joined government service after 1st of Jan 2004. So if anyone joined the government service on 1st of Jan 2004 or after that date, they will be in the new pension system and not the old one. In the new pension system, from your salary also, a small part will be deducted and that will be invested by the government and later on will be given back in the form of pension. That is the most important difference between the two. Old pension scheme, the person who was earning salary did not contribute anything. The government contributed everything. New pension scheme, even the people who are working, who are earning money, a part of their salary, a small part will be deducted, invested in the form of pension and that will be given back. That is the basic difference. Obviously, government servants did not want the new pension scheme. Why? Number one, in the old pension scheme, they did not have to contribute anything. Number one. Second important point in the old pension scheme, there was a fixed pension that they would get, 50% of the last salary. In the new pension scheme, it is not fixed because the money that you are giving to the government, that is being invested in the market. So at the market, your contribution or your investment can increase also, it can decrease also. So depending upon that. And that is why many people have been saying that we want to go back to the old pension scheme. In many state governments, you might have seen in many state governments, we have seen that state governments have been promising that we want the old pension scheme back. 
in fact even in just in today's newspaper you would have seen himachal pradesh has announced that from now onwards we are going back to the old pension scheme now the news is the government of india has said that anyone who joined the government service on a post where advertisement of the job was given before december 22 2003 understand this if you join the government for a job and the advertisement for that job was given before december 22 2003 then you can opt for the old pension scheme even now why the idea is let's assume i saw an ad in the newspaper on 20 december 2003 and in this ad i saw a government job i applied for it at that day when i applied for the government job i applied for the job thinking that i will get the pension from the government so new pension scheme should not apply on me that is what the government has said anyone who has joined government service because their ad was before 22 december 2003 they can still opt for the old pension scheme as well till august 31 so till august 31 they have been given this option that you can come back into the old pension scheme others do not have this option only these people have this option as i told you the main difference between the old pension scheme and the national pension scheme or the new pension scheme that you call it is that number 1 in the old pension scheme you did not have to contribute anything government will give all the expenditure in the new pension scheme a part of your salary will be deducted in the old pension scheme the pension that you will get was fixed 50% of the last salary in the new pension scheme it is not fixed it depends on how your contribution is invested in the market many state government especially those ruled by the opposite party to so the bjp many ruled by the congress party are going back to the old pension scheme chatisgarh himachal pradesh rajasthan for example are going back to the old pension scheme the next article from again the prelims point of view supreme court has given a judgment that in the consumer courts the president or the members of the consumer court their eligibility criteria should be reduced so far the eligibility criteria for someone to become the head of the consumer court was 20 years of experience 20 years of professional experience was the requirement for anyone to become the head of the consumer courts now the supreme court has said we are reducing it to 10 years so this is again a very important factual information for the prelims point of view the supreme court said we are directing that from now onwards a person having bachelor's degree from a recognized university and a person of ability integrity standing having special knowledge or professional experience of not less than 10 years in consumer affairs law public affairs economics engineering technology etc will be eligible for appointment as president and member of the state commission that is the consumer commission or the consumer court as you call it that is the big difference between what happened earlier and what happened right now the 20 year experience limit has been now curtailed to 10 years please do remember that this is extremely 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 important now recently a few years back in 2019 the government of india actually made some changes in the consumer protection act and i wanted to share these with you as well the consumer protection act is a law under which the consumers are protected for example you might have seen this online many times that people complain i ordered an iphone from amazon the product came in when you opened up the box there was a vim bar there was no iphone you would have seen these kind of news stories right now as a consumer when you buy something from the market you pay the money and when you are actually getting something else in return where do you go where can you complain this is where consumer protection law comes into the picture in 2019 the consumer protection law was changed these are the changes that were made please do remember these these are very 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 important for example in the earlier law if i had to file a complaint let's assume i bought an iphone from amazon and amazon sent i i'm living in let's say bangalore they sent me iphone from ahmedabad let's assume that 
that the factory is in Ahmedabad, they send the iPhone to me from Ahmedabad to Bangalore. Earlier, if I had to complain against this, I had to go to Ahmedabad to complain. Means earlier, complaint could be filed where the company is located. Now the complaint can be filed where the buyer is located. Now, you do not have to go where the company is located. You can actually file a complaint where your city is. Not just this, you can also ask for compensation if you are being harmed by certain product. At the district level code, compensation up to 1 crores can be given. At the state level code, 1 to 10 crore compensation can be given. At the national level, above 10 crore compensation can be given. The rules also apply to e-commerce companies, that is Amazon, Flipkart, etc., which was not the case earlier. So in 2019, the Consumer Protection Act was made, made much stronger and people were given much, much more rights as compared to what they had earlier. These are usually the rights of the consumers which are recognized all around the world. That if I'm buying something, if I'm giving money, I have the right in return to be heard. If I have a complaint, I need to be heard. Right to be informed means if there's something wrong in the product, I need to be informed as a consumer. The right to redress, right to a healthy environment, all these are rights that a consumer has when they are buying products anywhere in the country. The next important article from again prelims point of view is about the Kuno National Park. As you know, Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh became very famous in the past few months because Indian government translocated certain cheetahs from different African countries to the Kuno National Park. About 20 cheetahs were introduced from Africa. Initially, 8 were introduced from Namibia and then 12 were introduced in South Africa, from South Africa. So there are 20 cheetahs that have been introduced in the Kuno National Park now. Now why is this article in the news? Scientists are saying that maybe the Kuno National Park is not good enough to sustain the population of 20 cheetahs. Why? See, when you introduce such an animal from outside, let's say cheetahs are introduced in this environment, you have to ensure that they have enough prey. Prey means they have enough animals that they can hunt, kill and then consume for them to remain healthy. As for the scientists, most probably the population of their prey, that is, there is an animal called cheetal. So cheetal is the primary animal that cheetahs mainly hunt and they feed on. The population of cheetal also is reducing in the Kuno National Park. There are about 20 cheetals per square kilometer in this national park and their population is declining. So there is some worry about whether or not these cheetahs will be able to sustain for a longer time or not. Because the reason being these cheetahs were introduced in the Kuno National Park from some environment which was very very different and the problem again here is that usually in the past, whenever we see any translocation of animals from one place to the other, from an environment which is very, very different as compared to where they come from, usually these kind of translocation projects are not very successful. And Indian government also has to look into this, whether or not we want these cheetahs to sustain for a long time. From the prelims point of view, there are a few facts about the cheetah. Remember these. They are considered as the oldest of the big cat species. Right now, there are globally about 7,500 cheetahs. As you know, there is an African cheetah variety. There is an Asian cheetah variety also. Since 1950s, they have been extinct from India. The Asian cheetah and Northwest African cheetah are critically endangered. They are at a stage where most countries do not have any cheetah population. It is most of the African countries that have this kind of a cheetah population. The interesting part is, it is not just this project, there are many other projects which have been focused by the, which have been in focus for translocating animal from one place to the other. There are some projects in USA, there are some projects in India as well, where we have tried to introduce certain animal species. Let me give you some examples. For example, the Bisalpo rewinding project in 2018. In this project, about 150 endangered Indian antelope, apart from other species of flora, fauna, were introduced in the Jodhpur area. Similarly, Indian bison, or what you call as gaur, African-based company was given this responsibility to translocate 
about 19 Indian bison at the Bandhavgarh National Park in Madhya Pradesh. Their population has now increased to 70. We have the American bison, the grey wolves, which were translocated to America. It, America has also successfully done this. For example, the grey wolves were reintroduced in the famous Yellowstone National Park in America. The American bison was also reintroduced in, 19, in 1890s and the population has increased considerably. The reason why these animals are translocated from one place to other is, remember, all these animals are a very, very important part of the food chain. So, for example, if cheetahs eat certain animals and there are no cheetahs, then the animals which are the food of cheetah, their population grows to a huge, huge, huge number. And then that animal may start harming the agriculture, they may start harming something else that is of human interest. And that is why the entire food chain has to be sustained. Because even if you take one animal out of the food chain, that will harm the entire food chain from going forward. The next important from prelims again is the World Bank Index on Working Women. As the name suggests, they give scores to different countries, that is the World Bank, on the laws that exist in the countries in terms of working population. Meaning that in India, do women have same kind of laws, same kind of freedom when they go out to work as compared to males? In that aspect, India has been given a score of 74.4, an improvement from last few years, but again, still not a score that we should be proud of. There are 14 countries which were given a perfect 100 score, means 14 countries where women and men are considered as absolutely equal at the workplace. Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, etc. These 14 have been given perfect 100 scores, so they are absolutely equal for male and female at the workplace. In South Asia region, the average is 63.7. So India is above the average, but the highest score in South Asian region, that is the country in South Asia, where women have the best chance of going ahead and being a part of the workplace is Nepal, which has a score of 80.6. The report says while India has improved considerably, we have made better laws, we have much better maternity leave laws now in India, many more women are going out to work, however still a lot of problems remain. The workplaces still are not very safe for women. They are still not encouraged to go out and be a part of the workforce. A lot of women are not encouraged by their families also to go out and work. And these are some of the problems that we are still facing. This is an infographic to highlight how different states in India actually perform when it comes to their women being a part of the workforce. For example, in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, we see a lot more women being free to become a part of the workforce. While in states such as Odisha, Telangana, Meghale, this is very, very bad. Women are not free enough to go and be a part of the workforce. Similarly, uh, states such as Kerala, Goa, etc., Himachal Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, give a lot of freedom to the women to go out and choose their jobs, while the other states do not. Also, you have to understand one other very important parameter here. Out of the total of about 36 crore women in India who are in their working age. So there are about 36 crore women in India who are in their working age who can work. Only 13.3 are actually working. Only 13.3, so about close to one third of the women in their working age only are working. That also means that our GDP, our economy will never grow at a very fast pace if such a huge working age group is not a part of the workforce. And that is also a problem that will only improve if we give more encouragement, if we have better employment opportunities, if we create a safe environment for women to work. The last article for today from prelims point of view once again is about a scheme from the government of India called the Samarth scheme being run by the Ministry of Textile. So Ministry of Textile runs a scheme called Samarth. The scheme is that the Ministry of Textile partners with certain private organizations to give training to women in the field of textile. 
like tailoring, sewing, designing, these kind of skills are taught to people. Most of them are women, but it is open to males as well. For example, 86% of the people who have been trained under the scheme so far are women only. About one and a half lakh people have been trained under this scheme. The Ministry of Textile wants to partner with more private organizations who are open to giving training to people under this scheme. The person who enrolls in this scheme can choose from 184 different courses and they will be getting help from the government to get job as well. Training will be provided to them so that they can get a job in the garment sector somehow. The summer scheme stands for scheme for capacity building in textile sector. This was a part of the 12th five year plan and it has been going on to give a push to not just employment also towards handicraft and skills that people have in their hands in India, which is historically going on for a long, long time. Not just would it give a push to the handicraft sector. It will also ensure that more and more women enter workforce. As we saw in just the last article, a lot more women need to become a part of our workforce for our GDP to grow at a better pace. They would only become a part of the workforce if they get these kind of skills. And this is where schemes such as the summer scheme come in extremely important, which is being run by Ministry of Textile. Do remember this, these kind of questions about what scheme is being run by which ministry are important from the prelims point of view. So do ensure that you make a note of these kind of schemes as well. This brings us to the end of the articles that we had for you. These are a couple of practice questions I have on the screen, which I want all of you to write the answers to. Make sure that you do attend the quiz that we have on our Telegram channel as soon as this session ends. The link for the Telegram channel, if you have still not joined, is given in the description of the video. Make sure that you keep a track of all these articles, all these prelim specific news stories that we are discussing as well, so that you can revise them very, very easily once the prelims examination comes in. Do try and write these answers as well. I hope all of you learned a lot of new things today. We'll see you tomorrow, 10 a.m. Also, don't forget, once again reminding you, tonight, 8 p.m., the prelim strategy for the last 90 days will be discussed for geography. So don't forget to join us live for that as well. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.